Are we in the interview now? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I always ask when, like, it'll be five or ten minutes into it, and I, it's like uh, how they do movie credits and James Bond. The last one I saw didn't the credits didn't start until twenty four minutes into the movie, and I was like, that's how interviews go. Now I don't I don't know whether I'm talking to the whole world or just this dude, you know. Yeah, well, I like it. And, Let's assume and the... if I open my mouth and there's a mic. Then... Hello, what happened? I don't know. You just suddenly froze on me. You went. You were saying something, and you you kind of leaned forward and went. <laughs> oh God! I kind of wondered if you were messing with me at first. <laughs> <laughs> just frozen. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I totally know what I'm going to do at the next uh, band meeting Zoom. <laughs> Here's no, no unfortunately thing. not. Unfortunately, I, I wish it was an act, but that was, yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh no, I lost you again. I've got one more thing to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to love it. The next meeting is going to be yeah. it's gonna be a Monty Python-esque moment. That's awesome. I'm glad I'm inspiring that, these antics. That's it's it's just ridiculous. <laughs> How sweet to be an idiot. It never ends with technology, you know. It's full circle our conversation. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I really love um when people, you know, we'll talk music and I'll just take my turn and everything. But the minute somebody starts talking about um recording and doing all this stuff, I get really fired up and passionate about whatever I'm talking about, and I go down tangents of details about miking or this and that and and um i can tell that i really enjoy the whole i don't know what it is about it it's just like a giant it's like a giant puzzle to undo everything yeah and of course you know you're trying to do one thing this happens to me all the time and i know it happens to everybody but like so this is technology so you're trying to record a something or other and then it doesn't happen so you're uh wait a minute the kick drum mic went out so let's see let's i don't know is it no it doesn't seem to be uh, all right replace the cord uh, that's not it replace the mic blah, blah. and they say no you spend an hour down a rabbit hole trying to figure out the puzzle and the whole time you're still not recording the freaking drum part uh, and i'll like it's like you're messing like you're a carpenter and you're so interested in the hammer that you're never building the house yeah <laughs> see the, the it's jewel encrusted and the the it should be the other direction and it's wood handled and I wish it was metal handle. It's like, you're so focused on the inch on the tool that it's not happening for the, what you're trying to actually do is make art. Yeah. And, uh, in a way it's bothersome, but in a way, if you figure it out, you overcome it and you learn something for it, then you're better at doing it next time. So I'm not really mad at it because I'm always, it's always teaching me something. But on the other hand, I am trying to make an album. If the technology would not mind getting in the way, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it I used is. To just whip stuff out and play it, and some guy recorded me, and I went, "Oh, okay, see ya." Yeah. And now, now it's like not like that anymore. Now I got to know stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's it's ridiculous in technology. It's always been like you know, I, I'm more on the younger side too. It's not like I kind of grew up with with this, and it's still like right. you know, it's still a pain. <laughs> Even I feel then, like yeah. a lot of people say it's an age thing. No, not at all. It's... I, you know, I have, I've had to learn it from scratch myself because, um, when, when, and where I went to school, um, we not only didn't have computers, we didn't have air conditioning. We didn't have very good heat. We wore coats all day. And, mm. um, you know, we, I look back on, we even had a paper and pencil shortage. So you had to make sure to make your pencil last. And your oh paper my God. had to be utilized completely because there just wasn't more paper. Yeah. You know, and we but like I said, we didn't even have air conditioning, never mind computers. We we didn't even know what a computer was at the time I went through school. And in fact, even all the way through going to college, I didn't I went through college without a computer. Everything was handwritten or typed. Wow. Where did you go to college? Um, in Georgia. Okay. Everything in Georgia then. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm a Georgia guy. Yeah. I, I yeah. was born here, grew up here, went to, all the way through school here. But yeah, at that time, nobody had computers in college anywhere. It was 1977, 78. Yeah. So how did you get into music then? Like a record store, tape trading? I, you know, I actually, I just kind of grew up with it. Um, it was in my house. My mom started me on piano 
when I was about four years old. And uh, it was just always kind of around my sister's into music, my the other kinds of music, but still it was kind of in the house. So I grew up with the, the piano and then there was, I had a guitar when I was 10, a, a really nasty little acoustic thing with action real high and it like hurt your, <laughs> it made your fingers bleed a lot. And yeah. uh, at first I was like, well, this sucks. I want to do this. This sucks. What hurts you to do this? But, it, but, um, so I, but I kept messing with it. And uh, then I became, I was in school, I was clarinet and bass clarinet wow. and in school symphony and all that going all the way through school. And then I was in bands. The first time I was on a uh, stage playing a bass was, um, I was 15, started playing in clubs when I was 18 in 1977. So wow. it, I've never kind of, I've never not been playing music. The first time I was on, I actually did a performance of any kind was that, it's kind of interesting because I was so little. I was only five and I was made to get up. I had on piano, I had learned to play Silent Night, which is very, you just make a chord with the left hand and with your right hand, you're going, dum, ba, bum, bum. It's in C, probably <laughs> the way I was playing. So, and I actually sang with it. So I'm on stage at five playing an instrument and singing in front of people. So, I mean, is that your first gig in a way? I, I guess it is. I guess that's technically you your did. first I'm show. Playing. People are there. More people were there than it's some of the shows I've played. Yeah, I think half the people would be horrified to find out what you later, what the later shows you do. As, oh, uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, nobody I knew from my growing up past would think that what I do now is great or anything, probably. Yeah, so what was your introduction to like thrash metal then? Because that was like kind of your first musical step into like the um, whole business. The, yeah, the um so when people finally heard about it, so we were uh we started Hal Z started really as another band, really two bands, but anyway, it was at the end of 1979 and we formed this band. <clears throat> Um, called warrior we didn't know about the la warrior everybody brings that up and i go well we didn't have facebook and all that you didn't know about bands three thousand miles away or two thousand miles away or whatever you just didn't know unless they were household names you just never heard of them yeah. so there were bands named just like each other in other places because <laughs> it was just a cool name everybody's thinking the thing same thing i guess it's a cool yeah. name. But anyway parallel thinking so we had warrior know. and then eventually we had um Stacy, the lead who became the lead singer of Hallow's Eve, joined Warrior in the last year of Warrior. We were already playing some songs that became Hallow's Eve. We were just known for playing. There was no heavy metal in our in Atlanta, Georgia. There was none within 500 miles. So we were billed as Atlanta's only heavy metal band as early as 81, <laughs> 82, 83. We actually were not only Atlanta's only heavy metal band. We were Georgia's only heavy metal band. We were the only heavy metal band. So, um, so anyway, he so it's the reason I'm telling you all this is what happened in a nutshell is we slowly transitioned into uh, two of us wanted to play heavier and faster and the other two and then sometimes three guys. And eventually when we kind of decided to station, I went to the side and to our perspective, we replaced two guys and changed the name all in the same summer and became October Hallow's Eve and still played a couple of the same songs. We just changed how they went and whatever we were doing the mansion from tales of terror. We've been doing that. Wow. And we did that in warrior back in, I think Stacy wrote in 81 or 82. And then um, I wrote, there are no rules from how, from tales of terror. I wrote that in January of 1980 in a church closet. <laughs> well, very fitting. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, wow. I love bringing that one up. If anybody cares, because, that just shows you what I was doing instead of working. My job at the time was I was the janitor at a church. Wow. And I went in wow. Monday through Friday. And you know how dirty a church gets? Not much. So yeah. once I cleaned up from the Sunday stuff uh, and I was done by nine in the morning, I basically just sat there all day, like reading books and writing poetry. And I, that's where I wrote There Are No Rules. Wow. That's crazy. And it's really cool because there's some Hollow's Eve songs that are like, older than stuff off kill em all and like very early yeah. thrash which yeah. is really cool that you guys were one mm. of the first ever thrash metal bands really interesting yeah we really were i think at the same time there were other bands just like us in other towns of course and like i said i don't think we really knew of each other till we started seeing each other in the the fanzines you know the little type yeah 
typed and stapled and folded together and you could order it through the mail and some envelope would come and some guys things showed up so uh, uh, you know those were those are really cool and that's where i first learned about the other bands like i remember the first time i heard of overkill in a fanzine um nasty savage um uh slave that's where i first learned about um Metal Blade was actually in a fanzine. I started watching that label and go, and I was I was going, this this guy's doing what I want to do. This this is what's going on here. And I think at the time he only had Bitch and Slayer and a couple of other things. So anyway, from what I understand, from what I was told, that we were when we got when we were signed to a full album deal with Metal Blade, we were probably the seventh band signed. But our album, and then we were did Metal Massacre and all that stuff. Yeah. But then he was putting out albums so much over at Metal Blade that by the time Tales of Terror actually came out, we recorded it in 84, but by the time it actually came out and hit the shelves after manufacturing delays and this and other thing, we ended up being like album number 25 coming out. Oh, Cause, okay. Because we made it in 84 and it came out in July of 85. Now that I'm running a label, I get I get it. I was At the time, I was like, what the hell, man? I was like, we actually came out a long time ago. We just can't get it out yeah and uh i was all kind of mad about it for a lot and i said well if we'd come out when we actually wrote the songs and recorded them so we ended up coming out i think the same month as megadeth's first album and exodus bonded by blood was barely yeah, 85 month, right or barely it just come out like june or I've, i'm not sure but it's just yeah but it was all at the same time and i guess my point is that i think all of these bands were coming were experiencing the same musical cultural phenomenon at the same time they were just in different towns they were also listening to new wave of british metal and motorhead and girl school and ufo mixed in with dead kennedy's circle jerks and whatever and they're going hey what if we play let's play a song like lights out, but let's just play it. Like we're much more energetic. At it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's uh, all I got to that, do is play awesome. forward and backwards and play twice as fast. <laughs> and it'll be a whole new thing. So, so what was your first spin more like British new wave? And you're like, it's not fast enough. Well, kind of. Yeah. Well, like I said, the other guys, they, they tended to drift off into more of a, they wanted to go more off into a Def Leppard type thing and we were drifting off into uh stacy and i were listening to the first and second iron maiden a lot right then motorhead no sleep till hammer smith and we were listening to a little bit heavier stuff still the same area yeah. but they were shifting away from they wanted to wear scars and silk and stuff like that we were mm. like no 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 we were still going on stage in black and we were maintaining the uh heavy thing yeah, the Even thrash we look goofy too, but I'll admit it. But we weren't as goofy as the other guys. This is the way we thought. Of it. <laughs> yeah, even Slayer got criticism back in the day for like wearing eye makeup, like just eyeliner. <laughs> exactly. So it's, yeah, well, it's the first definitely time I saw a scene them, they, thing. they weren't, but they did. But Carrie was wearing spikes and nobody else was, and there was a little bit of a. You could tell they were kind of sussing it all out. Yeah, and, and you came up with the name Hollow's Eve, right? Yeah. Is that you? Yeah. Where where's that come from? Um, we literally it, it, we literally stood on our guitarist who we didn't want in the band anymore. We literally stood in his driveway, me and Stacy, and I I said uh it was October the 30th, 1983. And I said, let's just call it this. We're gonna we I had sat there mapped out. He, I took him aside and said, Look, I've been planning this band all summer long. I'm, I'm going to do something different. It's going to be, I want to do an album where each song tells a tale of terror. It'll be like, they'll tell little stories. It kind of ended up, it kind of happened, kind of didn't. But I don't think yeah. they got it. Oh. Yeah. So, um, yeah. But anyway, it, so t out of it all, Tales of Terror came out. Um, but I really stood there in the driveway and said, said I'll tell you what, um, we're going to give this one year and we're going to really throw ourselves into it. And I went militant. I mean, do or die. Like this is, we're not fooling around here. Hell yeah. And um, I said, I'm going to give it one year to the day. And on the 29th of October, the next year we signed the metal blade agreement. Had it been yeah. 48 hours later, we probably would have walked out of it. Wow. That's just said, We got to put a time limit on it. 
but uh, it was it was pretty cool. But that's kind of how it ended up being Hallow's Eve. So I so I presented to Stacy a list of about twenty names. I don't remember them all, but I remember some of them were pretty. Now I look back and they were pretty goofy. But uh, I think <laughs> well, do you Eve remember any of them? One. I said, "Here's twenty names. You pick it." And he picked Hallow's Eve. And do you later, remember any of those names playing. at all? We got about the second time he goes, I don't like the name of the band. I think we ought to change it. And I went, you can't now. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. No, 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 no. You kind of make up your mind and stick with something. <laughs> That's funny. 20 names. So were there any of those names you still remember? Or are they all just no, washed from your I, brain? Uh, I can't remember, but I'm sure they were not that great. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. No, I think how was Eve... Um, there was a, a song I had been working on called Hallow's Eve and uh, the, the lyrics of it. My idea for the song was it would be like the theme song of the band, which I would kind of would never do again, but yeah. it was like a theme song for the band. But in the middle of the song, after the uh, second verse, I wanted to interject a story, which I did. So that's why it says Hallow's Eve, including routine, the story routine, which is a short story I wrote. I, uh fixed it up to where you know it was a song and it was a poem more or less and so it's stuck in the middle of the thing it's to give so this is hallow's eve and here's an example of what we're going to do and it told a story i did have a song called brandon the brave brandon oh no oh my god it didn't make it on the (laughs) album but it was the one that didn't make it on the album that almost would have that that could have been my theme right there yeah it told a story (laughs) of of brandon the brave wow that's awesome a cool piece of lore right there it was it was a yeah 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 it was a it was all it was the one song it was the closest one to get on the album that i didn't put on the album and uh i just never really got that one together it told the story of a guy who was brandon the brave and he was the hero of the land and he did and you know everything when brandon made his stand anyway it was kind of fanciful (laughs) and he was the hero he saved people in the kingdom and whenever troubles came and evil this and that creatures so anyway, finally, but it was prophesied he would meet someone who would who would defeat him. So finally, this dark, I don't remember, dark night comes and and actually defeats him, holds him down and says and tells him, Brandon, you're just a boy. None of this is real. This has all been a dream. You're there is no Brandon the Brave. And upon your death, you will awake and find out you're just a boy. Yeah. Well, Brandon doesn't like that at all. It jumps up, defeats him, and he and now till the end of his days, he remains Brandon the Brave always. Wow. So he's not a real dude. So it turns out, you know, so I don't know. I thought it was kind of cool because it had this sort of Twilight Zone twist to the end. Yeah. Now I'm trying to remember all of the the Hollow's Eve discography. Did you ever put that out ever? No. Or is that wow? Would you ever turn that into that a, a dire wolf song? Happened. Yeah. Now that we're talking about it, I mean, I am writing a new album right now. I, the third record. Yeah. The, the, the dire wolf stuff is uh, more reality based, so I'm not yeah. sure I would dance around with fantasy in it or not. I, of course, I yeah, yet. and that makes sense. And, and doom metal has, has kind of always been very reality based too you think so i think so with especially with sabbath's first record and of course you have like lucifer elements but there's a lot of like almost very uh like wicked world there's a little bit of it where it's like that's that might be your reality yeah yeah true there's a couple of things that i believe in that that are personal that it's my reality i know it might not be real for you people but i usually don't bring it up if it's just so that personal but i do write some pretty personal stuff um the whole last album was written and recorded during the isolation months of um the covid era yeah yeah and uh, so a lot of a lot of the things that happened to me or feelings i had about what i witnessed while i was in the studio crept it became those songs a lot of it yeah. It, it's a very when you feel to me when i hear the album there's parts of it i don't even like to listen to because it brings up those dark emotions from that time they're real to me this is really what someone said to me in this song i got called at three in the morning from a family member who was feeling having suicidal feelings and they were in the midst of riots at the very moment oh, yeah. they showed me on their phone live helicopters going over their apartment cars on fire they could see the fires 
people yeah. running the streets. You can hear a gunshot right there. And, and she's that goes on all night. It's been <laughs> and, a crazy uh, couple years. Things she said to me and things I said to her are in the song, exact sentences. So it's a very real album to me. Yeah. And uh and what song is that? Do do we have a title? Or that is that is this all very indiscriminate desktop? <laughs> I made it so complicated I can't even say it. Why did I just call it like, <laughs> a number or something? Yeah, 72, uh, I don't know. Number 347. Um <laughs> indiscriminate trepidation. Okay. Meaning um something like random problems, senseless random problems. Yeah, well, well that's been the that's world a good that theme. This won't matter later. Y'all <laughs> Yeah. Just calm down. <laughs> I know. It's just hey, home, the, watch the a past movie, couple of years. Stuff. <laughs> and then they get arrested. And they go, hey, they got arrested. And this, that, and there. I go, well, they cho- you could have just like, when I get up in the morning, I go, should I go out and cause chaos? Or should I just, hey, look, leave it to Beavers on me TV. I want some cereal. Isn't that a much better way to spend the day than figuring out how to go to jail? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. not the whole day. I got to get up and start doing label stuff. But yeah, you know, of course. Yeah. Gonna, I mean, it's like nobody cares what you're doing, you idiot. Well, it's it's given bands plenty of material to work with. Oh, no kidding. Um, yeah. 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 These past couple of years have just been crazy. So how did let's talk about uh, uh, Tommy Stewart's Direwolf for a little bit. Uh, so how did how did that form? What's the whole story of uh, you starting that? And that's a two piece, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure it intended, but like a lot of things, it seems like most <laughs> Most things I've ever been in sort of gradually happen almost subconsciously. Like I didn't really make it happen. So okay. I did um, not much different than other bands. I took material that the last time I'm in, I'm in doesn't want to play. That's how I formed the next band. So like how was he <laughs> formed from the songs that Warrior didn't want to play? So we went out and made tapes of them and got signed. We did everything they didn't want to do. And that's what worked. <laughs> well people people were people was. yeah because I, I i feel like people were a little upset with the direction hollows eve went in because they're like this isn't you know traditional thrash and this isn't the first record because you guys it, a lot of people were saying it was a little more black metal inspired which i dug <laughs> some of it, it that i think that was in hollows eve by the fourth album what happened on the fourth album is we didn't have the, the original lead singer stacy which i now agree needs to be there Mm-hmm. And um, at the time, but we did get back original member Scully, who who calls himself Skeletor on the album uh, credits, um, Steve Schumacher. So I did get back with him. He ha- he had left Hallow's Eve because he because he wanted to be heavier. We already thought we were heavy. <laughs> he'd laugh at us. He'd go, no, 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 this is heavy. And then he so he tried to show us a song called Vampires Drink Deep. We didn't want to yep. do it. He went off and did it himself and called the band Lestragus Nosferatus and became a legit band of his own. And it was uh, probably the first black metal Atlanta band, bass band. Yeah. <laughs> so later, uh, so I got him back for the fourth album. And what I did with the fourth album is picked up three or four songs that we had been working on at the end of Monument Times. And I just simply sort of finished them off with Skelly in there, who, and by the way, at the same time, I joined him in Lestragus Nos, we were having Lestragus Nosferatus practice, same drummer too. We would have Hallows Eve practice and then just say, okay, we threw doing Hallows, okay, then we turn into Lestragus Nosferatus. So that album <laughs> ended up sounding a lot like like uh, the Hallows Eve version of Lestragus Nosferatus. Wow, yeah. And yeah. we ended up doing, and we ended up doing Vampires Drink Deep. So when that came out, everybody who liked Hallows Eve at the time said, um, this isn't the, they didn't keep it true. This is not the true Hallow's Eve and whatever. And I said, you know, one of the things we did decide when we started the band and started on the first time, we agreed that we wanted to grow and be a little different on every album. So each album, there was a progression. That So we had a conscious agreement that we were going to change all the time. And I figured from 88 to 2005, going to Evil Never Dies, it had changed. Just like Monument was much different than Tales of Terror. I don't know why everybody's so surprised that we were different now. 
And it was a different scene. And they were, oh, that's not true. How's even? I said, well, actually, these are the songs you would have heard on the fourth album had they come out in 1990 instead of 2000. Yeah. <laughs> Some of these are the same riffs and same words and everything. You're just now hearing them. That's all. It's, I feel like I just continued. This is what it would have been. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's, it's like, you're also not in the band, you know, it's like, who are you to tell me that? Oh, dude, this you don't know how many Hollow times Z. I've said that. Like, <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. Would y'all would y'all hand me the guidebook on how I write music for y'all? Because I I didn't know there was a rule book about how Hallow's Eve is supposed to be written. I thought whatever I, I'm in Hallow's Eve, I thought this is this is I'm an artist. Whatever I write is what the band is, regardless of what garbage it is. That is what I felt like. Maybe I felt like garbage, but that mm -hmm. but it's up to me what to write in as my music. I'm not. I hope people like it, but. I'm not going to ask for the rule book. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's music comes from that. The best music comes from that place where it's like, just, you know, it's what, how I want to express myself, what Regardless I want of, a song to sound. Instead not, of this is what people want to hear. This is what I want to, you know, it's, well, it I has to come from the heart. Like it, you know? but, but I figure I like it. And there's other people like me that somebody likes it eventually somewhere. There is an audience for you. Maybe you haven't connected with that audience for some reason, but I mean, if you've changed, maybe your audience is a different audience than you had. But Direwolf, so to speak. So what happened there is I made a demo album in 2015, and it was just scratch. It was just ideas. There were three or four songs in there that were full songs. I threw a cover on there just to see what anybody thought. Anyway, I only made a hundred copies of CD for it. I didn't really distribute or anything. I just ran around, and handed it to friends. Uh, other musicians, whatever, said, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And other than it sounded kind of muddy and this, that, and the other thing, it was a demo. Um, <clears throat> I got a pretty good response on it. So I ran out and got a drummer and I said, okay, let's start a band. First thing it needs a drummer. And so I went out and got a drummer and I said, I've got this one. I want to, I want to record this one. It'll be easy. So we set up in the little rehearsal space I had and I just, I threw a studio up right quick. And I said, um, so let's just do this one three minute song and record it. And we did um, drums and bass. It was live and off the cuff and learned in 10 minutes and let's play it. And we did it. And I went back and did a couple of vocal tracks to layer it in and whatever. Then I made a little single out of that and passed it around. People really liked it. I was surprised because it was an odd song anyway hmm. for, for me to pick. So um, it was only a little three minute song. So finally, so the drummer decided to say, I said, okay let's let's actually make an album at the same time i was starting a studio and i called it blue ogre noise lab so i went to this place where they okay. had studios in a warehouse and i got two rooms and one was a live room and one was the um room with all the pyramid phone and everything i had two isolation booths and i set all that up so the first thing i did was record us and we're in two separate rooms and can't see each other <laughs> so the first um so the first album was the way I did, I said, I want to do this kind of quick, lo-fi and impulsive. So I said, I told him, I said, so what I want to do is I want to run the song three times, me on bass in one room, recorded loud as crap. I said, I, it's also an experiment in seeing how loud you can record. Yeah. So I was running about 108 to 110 decibels in the room I was in. He's in a whole nother room and we're just communicating through the mics and I could hear him click it off. All right. So, so there's these 16 foot ceilings and he's in there and it's really clapping around and you can <laughs> You can hear it. One of the reviews said, this sounds awful. It said, it sounds like it was recorded in some kind of a giant warehouse. And I was <laughs> like, it was. Yeah, that's exactly what you it is. You nailed it. Yeah, you nailed it, yeah. And uh, all that's we did funny. was play each song three times, and I just took the best, I took the best one, bad notes and all. Whatever happened, best one out of three. I told yeah. myself, I want to just go ahead and get it out and start rolling, because this is not going to be the main album of ours, I, I don't think. I think this is just to get in the ball game. Yeah, that's so funny. So wow. I was already on to the next thing, and I think, and then the next album was, uh, and then there was a release, an EP release that was really the. Um, I was having the Doomsday Deferred, the second album sessions, and uh, sorted songs for Cold Gray Sun were the four songs that I didn't feel like they 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 didn't really fit in the overall album, so I kept taking songs back out and going maybe later, maybe later, maybe. And finally, I realized those four songs kind of fit, so I went ahead and put out the EP. And really, mm. that's the Castaway song. It's from the whole session. They, but they kind of fit each other. So I, now it's funny because that's one of my favorite things I ever did was that EP.
it wasn't really meant to come out. So anyway, huh. and it keeps being like that. So anyway, Doomsday Deferred was very um, on board. It was more polished and whatever like that, but it was still very dark. This new one we're recording is much brighter and uh, more upfront sounding and a little more care to, to it. Interesting. Cool. So that's, we, that's interesting again, here. with this constant changing, I don't want to want to do one thing all over, even even within the same band, but I've also done other bands, whatever. I want stuff to be different. I mean, you got one life. Why don't I want to just keep doing the same thing over and over and over? I saw the movie. I saw the movie. I get it. Exactly. Yeah. And and you've always had almost like a, a little bit of psychedelic roots to you. And, and you can kind of hear that with your uh, direwolf project. Now, do you think do you think Hollow Z was holding you back creatively? In some aspects, but it was good because we were all um, the the three writers in the band, uh, me, David, and Stacy, would bring stuff to practice, and the others might jump on them and go, "Oh no, we're not doing that!" Or <laughs> I like the whole thing, but I don't like that one part. That's goofy. Or yeah. no, 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 that's too. We, this song is going to be wide open all the way through. We don't want a slow part. We don't want to break down or whatever you want to term it. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of competing with each other. So we, the way we worked is we came in with a song. This is kind of how I always work with everybody. We come in with a song already written and say, here's the song, and then show everybody how to play it. And then, yeah. then all the gatekeeping would start. But I think from that, when bands do that, it's um, kind of good for the band overall, even though it might be disappointing for the writers sometimes, because the really the best parts are the parts that are left. I think. Yeah. But so, that leaves a lot of stuff. Like what to get back to what you were saying, really, uh -huh. is that, that leaves a lot of stuff that didn't happen for that guy. And so what I did is when I started doing the direwolf stuff, these were a lot of the ideas that I never got to do. And now I could expand on them and follow up. And then, yes, there's a lot of psychedelia. Uh, I've often said if Pink Floyd came out now and they were and they went metal, it might sound something <laughs> like our work. They would totally be doom metal, especially with uh, uh, some of that early stuff. I think there's uh, the Nile song. That's oh, like yeah. A very the early. Moore and Uma Guma yeah. are huge influences on me, my writing, everything I'm doing. Interesting. Yeah, you can hear that. That era that's, was yeah. definitely a big influence on me. Cool, cool. Wow, that's that's interesting. So why why the transition from thrash to doom? What about doom metal flicked with you? It was just, um, well, I went from thrash to uh, bloody... Bloody Gyres was the next thing I did, which was a progressive doom band. And it had one member from Hallow the last Hallow's Eve lineup in it, Chris Abamani, who now has a band called Thrum, <laughs> which is a killer band. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so I had him there. That was doom, but a little more. It was closer to Hallow's Eve, sort of. It was uh, dual guitars. It was harmonies. It was it was a little... It had one foot in the old uh, New Wave British metal story. Then I, then I started... The, the Direwolf thing was happening sort of beginning at the same time in Embryonic. Then I stopped to do a thing called Negative Wall, which brought in a... Which was kind of Direwolf, but with a guitarist. That album was made on purpose as a sci-fi themed album, except for there's one cover interesting but the whole th everything that happens in the stories in the songs in negative wall gamma jaloose the name of the album they all happen on the same planet kp22 blah, blah, so blah. Cool. the whole mythology that was happening in that band in fact i was i was starting to write a, a fictitious language for it when we decided not to go forward anymore wow so you had like a concept discography oh totally yeah we we it came on stage you can look it up we came on stage we were wearing like lab suits we came over with the outer <laughs> limits tv show theme and uh we were up there with safety glasses and all kind of that's so cool and, and we came in black and white so the 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 lights were always black and white or on blue and we were wearing like grayscale makeup wow so it, looked like, it looked like an old tv show wow is this on like streaming yeah like is this out oh cool cool yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll they totally have, check uh, that out. Wow. Blue. I wish there would be more, but uh, unfortunately, the guitarist, uh, not long after that, had a um, had a stroke and lost the use of an arm and isn't playing guitar right now. And we don't know if that'll ever happen again. That's so awful. For now, there's not going to be. It really had to be those three wow. guys. So that 
and we'll probably never have again, unfortunately, because I was really enjoying what we were doing. It was very nerdy, you know, and I loved it. It appealed to me a lot. Yeah. But so, so anyway, I went from that to, so, and then, and then we're doing the, but see, we're getting back to some more energy because <clears throat> on the last Direwolf album, there was a song called Two Tra Gyam that was a little bit more kind of like a, all, it wasn't thrash, but it was kind of like a little more energy and started feeling a little more Hallow's Eve-y. Live, we started playing some Hallow's Eve songs at the end of our shows. So the whole Dire Wolf, uh, we did like 74 shows for the Dire Wolf tour for in 14 months, just kind of off and on road shows, and it ended up being a lot. But at the end of every show, we played Metal Merchants, sometimes horror shows, sometimes suicide and horror shows, sometimes. But we, we played Metal Merchants every show. When we toured with Grave Huffer, whenever we did mm-hmm. shows with Grave Huffer, Richie, <clears throat> Grave Huffer's on Black Doomba Records. Yeah. Richie would get up on stage with us. Uh, we would open for them and have Richie come up on stage and play the Hallow's Eve, play Metal Merchants with us. Cool. So all of a sudden, so we're at like the Tennessee Metal Devastation Festival. And there's 1,200 people. All of a sudden, a guitarist comes on stage and we turn into Hallow's Eve. People, <laughs> I remember people standing there in front of the stage going, what, wait a minute. Hey, I come off stage and said, I didn't realize who I was seeing until they come going, Oh my God, I just saw Hallow's Eve, maybe for five minutes, but I saw Hallow's Eve. And I'm like, That's I'm awesome. Going, yeah, yeah, we're doing it. It's just not, you know, but it's a piece of it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It was awesome. It was so, so much fun to do, too. And I really can't thank Richie enough. By the way, Grave Huffer's last time, Depart from So Much Evil, has a is a thrash album, their own Black Doomer Records. It has a 22-minute epic song on it called Depart from So Much Evil. And uh, my drummer and I get got to guest on it in a spot in the middle of the called Purgatory. The, the 22-minute piece is based on uh, the writings of Dante in Dante's Inferno. Dante's cool. Divine Comedy. So um, you might want to check that out. It just came out. I 100% will. That's so awesome, man. Uh, that's that's so cool. So that's that story so funny with... Uh, uh... Hello, Z. Like, just like, oh my God, I saw him for five minutes. <laughs> oh, what was what was uh, interesting in that show is the very second we got through playing Metal Merchants, the stage manager told us our, they said we have to cut it off. They actually cut our set off. So that was all. Wow. We, we could have done more Hallow's Eve, but they, we could have. Yeah. So they cut us right. off. And I was like, oh man, don't, when we are doing it. <laughs> The band just reformed five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, we just reformed five minutes ago. Everybody wanted to hear it. We got in the middle of it and y'all said, no, 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 no. And I'm like, see, that's why there's not other members. <laughs> Stuff yeah, like that. yeah. So so why did Hollow's Eve end in 2013? I just, you know, I finally just called it officially over. It Same thing. One day I, I was musing. <clears throat> it had gone kind of bad lately and I went, I noticed that it was right at October 30th. And I went, okay, I'm calling it. <laughs> I said, that's a nice even 30 years. Technically, wow. 83 yeah. to 2013. I said, you know, this is a very convenient moment. But what had happened is, I don't want to tell bad stories about former members or anything, but some members had canceled about three gigs in a row. That were One of them was a, an overseas show that um that was a festival that we were headlining and it was canceled literally two or three days before it happened tickets already sold and everything I, I i told the guys that we can't do that i know these people you guys are just talk hearing about stuff through me i know these people and i can't be that's not gonna happen people your integrity and and your word is is everything in the music business and i said so and it happened three times around the third time i went that's it i'm out of here i don't we're uh, we're done yeah very <laughs> I, which is so, justified which is totally justified and, and your plate is so full right now with black duma and uh man Myers. i'm so happy i can't yeah. stand it yeah w- it, would you ever do a one-off show again or is it just you know what well, i'm just looking people, forward the way it could happen i think is it, it won't happen with former members it's the b- bad thing it's just not each member, when you think of each one, they've they've got something that they've moved on in their life to do that's not got, I don't think any of them hardly ever played music again. That was it. Wow. I don't know why everybody plays with me in the minute they're done playing with me. They <laughs> yeah. play music all together. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, 
I'm not doing any more of that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know wow. if it's me. Is it, it that guy? Is it me, or is it just they get a good taste of what it's really going to be like? And they go, oh, never mind, never mind. I didn't know it was going to be like that. They're buying into the media. So I I call it um something to be aware of is uh for musicians is um unrealistic expectations you don't want a case of that this is there is a music business you can make some type of a living at it you're a great you're example of that you're with your label. Make a million dollars and i go yeah <laughs> i want to fly jet airplanes but, <laughs> I go, no, but okay, let's try and break even first and then see if we can make some type of part-time money at it. but you have to constantly educate yourself in this ever-changing music business I'm constantly taking workshops, educating myself, talking, sharing with people. I'm constantly trying to grow myself. Um, and I think one of the best things for me is to have a studio and have other bands in and interact with them and see how it is with them. And also running the label. I really didn't mean to start a label. It wasn't a goal of mine. I have, I, I really didn't want to. But wow. what happened is it was tied in with Direwolf because so I took the Direwolf stuff first time and I shopped it uh, to eight labels that I wanted to be on. They all ignored me except one who said, I'm really busy right now. Uh, we can talk. I'll, I'll talk to you about it next week. I'll call you next week. And they never did. And I said, you know, I'm not going to chase you. You either want to, or you're done. you know, what's on the table. You yeah. Pick up your own fork. Yeah. Um, I'm just chasing you. Going to hear your reasons why you can't, if you do. They'll probably answer. I know them. I, I, I'm i pretty acquainted with everybody in some way. So, but they just never answered. And I finally, you know, I got past the, I got, and then I finally got uh, a guy in France to put out the album and that went however it went, but it, it happened. But I finally shrugged and said, you know, if I want this to really happen, I go, I know how to do the work. I know what has to be done and what I don't know, I can find out. And I just need to, I'll have to work hard. And I said, there's an awful lot of bands that I know that I'm aware of that really could. I've been doing this for, at that time, four decades. Now I was counting up like 48 years. And I and yeah. I go, I know a lot of stuff. And I've made a whole lot of mistakes that other people are about to make. And I might could, if they're receptive to it, I might say one thing or show them one thing that might save them two years of experiments. Yeah. I said, I think I have value in my experience at this point to some level. And if I find the right band that's they're ready to be on a label and I'm at the same level that they're able to benefit from it, I can take them to their next level where they can springboard off and maybe go to something bigger. Yeah. But I think I, I really can help bands. So I so I said, fine, I'll just sign myself. <laughs> <laughs> Which is my entire career's been like that. I don't That's like so how cool. people record me. Never have. And I saw I said, well, I'll just go make a studio and record myself. Wow. Um, so, so last album I couldn't get a drummer in, COVID whatever. Uh -huh. I sat there and said, okay, I'll just figure out how to play drums. <laughs> and I, <laughs> the one of the, the track I was just talking about, indiscriminate wow. trepidation. I'm the drummer on it. It's my first drum track. Really? Wow. That's I just I can't if I need something, I just learn how to do it and go do that. You've always and even like learning about uh hollows eve and everything it shows me that you have such a drive you know and even with this it's crazy that dyer's dire wolf literally spawns black duma i had i had no idea that's so interesting it, it did it did yeah. so now i'm working with all these great bands i just signed um to the two i just signed were bands that um i've actually been chasing for about two years each one is indus valley kings from new york from long island okay and this will be their third album they're doing with me, which is kind of good for me because I think they're at the level that they're really ready for it. You know, they've already got stuff under the belts because the other, a lot of the other bands, this was their first album or their first thing. And I, and I, sometimes they weren't sure how to act with the label. I was having to kind of really um, come to terms with them on, uh, this is what you do. This is what I do. And, and sometimes they were they were like, oh, I don't know if we like it that you're doing that. And I go, well, wait, do you go to Metal Blade or somebody? Yeah, be, I'm being cool. You don't know how it's going to be when you get go up. It's going to be you're not going to have as much in, in it. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, it's interesting because I I just talked to a uh, uh, John Gallagher Raven. 
Uh-huh. And, and they had a period like that where it's like the label, uh, oh, was it? A, I think it was Atlantic. That was like, oh no, you're you. Th- we're we know what you guys are gonna sound like. <laughs> you're exactly. That's our job to know what you guys. Kinda, sound. Yeah. Um, yeah. So on this label, it's really an artist friendly label. The other band I just signed that I'm very excited about is called Ember, E-M-B-R, from Birmingham, Alabama. Cool. And I'm, I'm very excited about them. Um, <clears throat> they're at the perfect place, too. They've already been recording and already been around several years. And this new album of theirs, I've already heard it. I've already seen the art. I'm saying, oh, my God, it's going to be so good. That's awesome. They know what Brandy is, too. They know how to make a theme for an album. And the songs have a area that they're about they know how to explain what they're about that's one thing it's hard to get bands to do is like i go so what are you about they go well we just rock and roll i go no 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 no, none of this generic stuff what are you trying to tell people who are you why why are they supposed to like you tell me that yeah why should they like you and everybody's not going to we got to find your audience like who's your audience so (laughs) i had a band coach She's <clears throat> for the last album. She said, "Who likes your music?" I said, I don't, know, "I don't know. That's that's true. Who likes my? Who's your audience?" She goes, "When you're on stage, who do you see in your audience for Dire Wolf?" And I went, "Middle-aged men." She said, "Are there any females?" And I went, "There's one in the back, not doing something else." <laughs> yeah, I need to say I'm person. <laughs> and I and she said, and "I said it's middle-aged men with beards." craft beers or pbrs i guess they're trying to be that's a craft beer in yeah box. yeah so anyway and they're all doing this if, if they like you they're all doing this all 50 of them are going that's the nod of approval yeah the nod of it approval used to, right the head thrash, you know before a pit in do metal they do this <laughs> And I said, yeah. uh, and she said, do you know what kind of jobs they have? And I said, you know, from me poking around, I said, it sounds like most of them have IT jobs. <laughs> they probably like the Hobbit in Godzilla movies. She yeah. Goes, they're nerds. Kind of. Yeah. I said, they're cool nerds. Yeah. yeah. That's I said, I funny, think that's kind of the audience. Yeah, exactly. And she said, in other words, they're you. Oh, that's when I had the epiphany that, yeah, a band's audience is themselves. Is who... So whatever you write or whatever you do, there are going to be, that's the people you want to come. You want to find the people who are like you because you yeah. like your band. You just don't want to be the only guy in the room that likes your band. So you need to go play to those people. Yeah, exactly. And that's so, that's, like I said, like, that's interesting to hear. Cause like, I feel like that, that goes for like every art form almost. Cause like, even with comedy and stand up, it's like, you know, you get, you get fans when someone, when you tell a joke or a story and someone points, it goes that I, I exactly know what that guy's talking about. I, I know that situation. I can relate to that. And that's a fan right there. And music, it's almost the right. same way where they connect with a song. So, so yeah, it's, 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 I, I, I would imagine it's hard to be a, 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 a comedian, a stand-up comedian right now in this world of um, everybody being touchy, sensitive. and Yes, it's it's very scene-based, though. Like, I live in uh, New England, and it's a right. little, it's PC, it's a little sensitive, but you go to Austin, Texas, and it is anything goes, crazy, outlaw comedy, so... So it's very scene based, funny enough. Like yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's kind of we music over too. well in Texas during our tour dates. We've we've played a lot up and down in the eastern half of Texas, the the whole San Antonio to Lubbock, Dallas, Hubbard. For some reason, we people love us in Hubbard, which is a very small town. But that whole strip up and down from Bucky's to Bucky's, that's where we we do so well there i wish it wasn't so far away it's a thousand miles if we don't have a a stop between here and there we actually have to drive all the way there we usually stop in Mm. lafayette or rain just off the highway is our halfway point on the way yeah but we like that we did play you know we did make it up to jewett city connecticut and played okay uh 
the the New England Doom at Stonefest was there. Um, it's oh. Dwayne Eldridge's place and it is now closed. Mm. But it was an awesome venue. That's awesome. Yeah, at least you made it kind of close to New England. You know, if if you guys ever come back, I'll definitely see you. But we will, we will. I just yeah. got to get these recordings done, and uh, we're certainly an east an eastern half of the U.S. based band. So going up and down ninety five is yeah for us. <laughs> I know every Cracker Barrel. <laughs> that's awesome yeah and just the drives like it's something we can definitely relate on because it is like you know i've had to go on those five hour drives just for like you know a gig or something and it's right. the road you know especially like you being an independent label and helping out all these bands and stuff it is you you kind of do have to deal with the road and everything Oh yeah, I'll be going. I just came back from Baltimore last week. Just it was for family stuff, but I got to go right back. Are you going to the Maryland Doom Fest? I I saw that. I'm I'm very tempted. I'm going everywhere Don't now. Go, and... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a I'm a I'm a sponsor, and we'll be vending there, and I'll have the whole. I'll have like three tables up. Black Doomer Records. We go there every year. I'm gonna have all the new vinyls from Holy Roller, Minerva, South Carolina band um i won't have ember ready yet i'll have well i might have the new vinyl from uh grave huffer but i do have the cds cool um but anyway i'll have all the new oh the new grave next door i'll, I'll have that there i'll have all the new stuff so that's cool um but anyway yeah that's it's, awesome it's really good it's four days and it's like a 100 bucks for four days you can go individually and go one day it's 25 dollars. it starts at noon and ends at midnight wow that's pretty good for 25 bucks wow I don't and, know. And I tell people, they go, well, I don't know if I'll have the money. I go, ask your kids for it. <laughs> yeah. I got 25 bucks somewhere. Start, They've been a lemonade stand for years. <laughs> what, what is this? Do you if know, you can't have 25 bucks as an adult. <laughs> just ask children, your kids. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, do? What do you mean you ain't got 25 bucks? <laughs> $25. Yeah. Start just a lemonade ask, just, stand. Go up to the grocery store and stand out in front and throw your hood up. Just say your car broke down. You don't have any money. Would you please help me? Do that for 30 minutes. Yeah. Recycle <laughs> a few cans, you know. You can get that 25. That's that's so cool. Yeah, I'll try try to make it, man. Probably somebody that's at an easy... Maryland Doom Fest would give you 25 bucks just so you can come in and join the fun. Yeah. <laughs> sit around out front and look wistful. 25. That's like, that's nothing. That's very, that's surprisingly yeah, very whole, cheap. I think, I think of, I'm not be wrong but i believe a four-day pass is 100 bucks wow i think don't like say it's in stone it might be 120 but it's not much it's still 120 it's for four days yeah you know, it's like is headlining yeah it's even like uh bands who are doing like small venues coming around here it's like still like 35 a ticket and mm -hmm. ju that's just for like a headliner and an opener so i gotta say well new england can be a little pricey um comparatively mm -hmm. um you know, yeah, well, you I have a point. That, but that's that's still, you know, if you really want to see something. Boston compared to Maryland, yeah. <laughs> there oh, yeah. there might Maryland's be a little bit of like a gap right there. And... Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's that's Maryland, so funny. to me, I feel very at home there, and I've played there a lot because um, when I'm in Maryland, it's almost like I feel like I'm, I'm at, in Atlanta. They're just so the regular folks, but they have crabs. <laughs> yeah 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 we, we got we got lobsters, lobsters and stuff. crabs here too but they're real um, regular folks there's certain places i feel very comfortable at. i'm always comfortable in texas i really love playing in the wisconsin area for some reason we do well in the towns i up and down wisconsin so we make a big effort to get there state yeah. by state um next time Tennessee. it seems like mississippi we've only played mississippi once and that we played played a place that was closing <laughs> night it was closing they ran out of beer as a matter of fact when i asked for one that was they said oh we just ran out we don't even have any more beer and wow was like, this was a it was a cool gig because it was all two-piece bands it was two it was three two-piece bands in a row so we all had a good time playing for each other and uh, there was, a, it was, you know, a reasonable amount of people there, but it was kind of weird that ran up here. It's weird. I said, it's the only place in Mississippi we've ever found to play. Now, yeah. I know there's other places, but for some reason we just keep missing them. <laughs> are, are there any places like that you haven't played that you really like to? And, and like, realistically, like a state you haven't played, you know, I know you probably oh, would play Japan. There's certain, <laughs> yeah. There's certain places I've, I've, uh, 
never been able to uh, for some reason the cards have never lined up for us to play reggie's in chicago i've always wanted to go there and play that's cool that'd be cool played in the chicago area outside of it in suburbs so something or other park something other park gary we played in gary like three times so you're almost in chicago yeah yeah not in chicago so and we're always going up and down through there i don't know we just never have lined up with a promoter at reggie's but there's a there's a few places like that i got i've got like a whole spreadsheet on clubs and promoters and there's certain places that it just seems like we're never It'll probably take, I don't know why it takes five years to get somebody to say, okay, you can play. I'm like, okay. Or then they call me like 10 years after the fact, go, hey, can we get you guys? And I said, well, we, <laughs> I, I, I think I've heard of you. And I go, well, I'm the guy who's emailed you keep not answering like 80 times for five years straight. Now all of a sudden you want us to come play. Well, that band doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> that was two bands ago. When the drummer passed away. Yeah. No, we wow. Can't play now. But I have this other band. They go, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but wow. we have another band. <laughs> uh, not that one. Never mind. Well, if you're, if you're, that's, that's, that's crazy. No, and yeah, it, it's either. promoters, promoters can be hell, I've heard. Like just, yeah. Worst. It's one of my pet peeves is the, the not answering anybody in music business that I get it. You get a lot of emails. So do I run a label? You can't imagine. You have to get, proficient at answering people and and you have to get hey man there's nothing wrong with just saying five words of no we're not interested right now maybe later it's yeah. just courtesy it takes five seconds make a template what's so hard about it yeah well even like as like you know a journalist or whatever i'm doing it's like it is still it's kind of that struggle of like getting artists on and trying to interview people you know i've been trying to get the guy kate from higher acts on and i've done so many things i, I think We've had four Zoom meetings so far, and it just hasn't gone yet. So it is, well, it is a struggle journal, connecting with people. I think journalists people. get a lot more emails than even the labels because, uh, I mean, they have so many bands sending them stuff. It, it would just be downright impossible to actually listen to it all from what they described to me. Mm. I get probably five pitches a week. I actually yeah. do listen to them while I'm I, doing filing or whatever, but I actually do give it a run, and I always do respond, and I always give them a little uh, – I'm not, we're not signing anybody right now, blah, blah, blah. But I, but I say, but I did enjoy the production, especially enjoyed the bass in a certain song. I give them a couple of specifics and to let them know that I really did listen to it. And I go, you, you're, you didn't get a deal, but you made a fan. I'll keep yeah. up with you guys. Hey, maybe in a couple of years, please check back. Yeah. And, and I have a few labels who email me and like, it's, a, it's just a lot of stuff and I'd love to get more into it, you know, but it is, it is cool. Um, and going back to Doomba, like, it's really awesome you're doing an independent label. Um, I do want to ask, like, we were talking about the business so much. Is there, is there like, a key piece of advice you give bands when you sign them about, like, the whole business and the music industry as a whole? I don't know. Like I said, one, one thing I tell them is uh, I try to tell them to keep themselves in check about having unrealistic expectations. Yeah. It is out there for you to do, but the way you make if you're trying to make a living at your band or whatever is forget the band thing it's just um there's there's mm -hmm. ways to make money in music it's not through the music i tell them i go you can give lessons if you have pa maybe you can rent out some of your equipment if you have an overabundance of it or you could um go into coaching other bands if you know your stuff whatever your talents are start pulling that stuff and maybe create an account and and start pooling some of these talents you all have you can all do other things besides actually write the music and uh, like i had someone today was uh, fussing about not getting paid from all the spotify plays he has and i said then you're seeing spotify incorrectly it's a it's a marketing and promotion tool to let people be aware of your music and hopefully people can hear it maybe you'll get feedback and learn something that's what it's for never mind the pennies and stuff that yeah if you're doing all the right stuff the the money will come just do all the right don't worry about it don't worry about it. it'll come but yeah um so put your feelers out so i'm like for instance so i'm producing two albums paying projects through the year i've got one coming it's like the end of summer fall or something so that's a full album project so i'll get paid to do that by the hour um 
then I've got the label. It does make money, but to my own fault, I always, I always take whatever money I'm making is basically paying for the next band. <laughs> so when I get stuff and a new band, and I'm talking to a new band about what they're about to do, and I'm getting a quote on it, the, the down payment for that and buying them some, some PR from a company and stuff like that, um, that's probably from the sales I had from the last uh, pre-sale from the last album that came out. So yeah, there, there's plenty whatever, of plus things. cargo and the pressure plates is basically funding crossfire. What I'm just saying, that <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm that... juggling it all. I, I'm, I've never took any money out for myself because I started the label to help my band, of course, but also I wanted to help other bands. I felt like, it was a time in my life when I could do something that would actually help art. It would actually help our music and uh, help other bands that are a little bit younger than me and probably just need a, they need a hand. Totally. A the next generation. Them. What can I tell them? I don't know. I just tell them little things like that. Just uh, try to get out, figure out ways that your band can make money that isn't necessarily about your music. Um, be nice yeah. to people. Be, be yeah. pleasant to people. Your word, like I said earlier, your word and your your uh, your integrity and how you treat people in the music business is kind of everything about when people, they might not talk to you for two years, but they'll remember this guy. And next thing you know, they're asking you to come and guest on their album for a lead guitar part. You haven't even talked to him in two years. I got a guy like that right now. <laughs> from, a, from an old from an older classic rock band that I've got coming in. It's going to guest on my album is because I made friends with him about two years ago. Cool. We haven't spoken much lately, but um, I, I did say something about a trip he was on. Cause I'd been there too. And he came back, Hey, yeah. And he sent me a message. Go, when are we going to do that? He remembered it was like two years ago. Yeah. So, wow. You know, all that stuff comes back around. Be cool to people. If you want opportunities, you have to keep putting yourself out there. You have to be on socials. You have to be. Social media is not a chore. It's it's called social media because you're supposed to go be social. <laughs> go be social. Yeah, well, that's how we met too. You know, and and it's like it's it's the music industry has changed in that in that way where it's no longer analog. It's all digital. It, the the networking's digital the yeah. how people listen to your music's digital it is just such a new age oh my God. and it's it's ridiculous it's it's crazy and, I, and and like there are benefits to it cuz it's not there's no like scenes anymore really it's like everyone everywhere has your music a lot of laughing or can over. access it yeah it doesn't matter if you're a doom man or not we play in a lot of lineups where we just flat out feel funny there because it's a death band before us and a thrash a crossover <laughs> punk band after us and we're in the middle going but i think everybody wants to see a little of everything and so everything's crossing over and overlapping we were talking about before we came on about um everybody in the industry is like co-workers now that's kind of how i see it people who are even fans i mean they're supporting the existence of a scene so they're just they're very important and yeah. then uh, there's the journalist who might also be a musician. And then there's a musician who also has an independent label helping other artists. And I learned a lot from that because I, I get to see behind the scenes in each of the bands on the label. There's about eight right now in my label. Yeah. They're, they all act differently. And some of them think this is how a band acts, but I'm like, you're the only, they don't know it, but they're the only one acting like that. <laughs> but I'm like, that's, that's the culture in their band. So I have to respect how each band's run. It's very interesting to me to see how all the bands do things. It so is. It, it enriches my experience of watching them. It is. And you've seen quite an evolution of the art form so far, you know? And, and and yeah, like it's so funny you bring that up because like I I I went to a a local hardcore show lately, like a like a hardcore punk show, and in the middle of the lineup was just a doom metal band. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? I but but it I, worked, and and everyone there dug it, you know. So it's like it's it's again it's it it's parallel to this world we live in of streaming, where everything's just it's not like it's not scenes anymore. Just everything's in this like big soup of of music. So it's it's music, cool, yes. yeah. <laughs> That's a yeah. If you had a compilation, 
record you made that had like every style imaginable in a soup of a soup a tasting of music that's, they, a, that's um, amazing stew yeah stew a pot Art. they um yeah but yeah we're all kind of together in it so you know so i go and do the the label thing and then i'm sponsoring at certain festivals um so because i like to get i would go and do that when my band's not playing at maryland doom fest this year i'm not even playing i'm going just to do the festival just to do that i would probably go to but there's some of these festivals i would go to anyway even if i wasn't vending or whatever i just like getting around i like road yeah. trips well it was on road trips and we're not even going to see music we just go to I'm, I'm like a dog with my head hanging out the window <laughs> my tongue is laughing the week. i just want to go anywhere if you just called up and said hey man i've got an apartment in the french quarter my family does you want to go for a week i'd probably go yeah let's go i'll, I'll just arrange everything to happen and i'd i'd schedule all my facebook postings where i don't have to mess with it and just go to new orleans well that's a great uh i just like having fun I, i'm not sure i want to call it a skill but that's a great thing to have doing what you do you know liking driving because it's a big part of the uh i the love job. it it's so funny because there's all the things of your life. Is it like this for you? There's all the things of people's lives that they don't realize when they're growing up. This is this way, this, 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 this. And then when you grow up and you end up doing your life and you realize that you were inadvertently trained for exactly how your life ended up. My parents love to impetuously, spontaneously get in the car and go places. So when I, my bands first started touring, I barely needed, to, at the time we didn't have GPS and cell phones and all in the early 80s. But I could hop in a car and just go to New York, and I didn't need to see a map. I know to go up 85 and get on 95 at Petersburg, and yep. I know how to go. Yeah, and, uh, I already knew how to go. It was funny because I didn't have to pull out maps. Generally, we couldn't find the club when we got in the neighborhood. That was always our problem. We <laughs> circles for three hours looking for that club. The pinpoint, yeah. Yeah, so we're stopping at stores like from 4 to 7 o'clock going, do you know where the spit spot club is? <laughs> you know where the spit spot club is? Hey, do you know where the spit spot club is? Yeah. Of course, we're probably carrying a cooler with beer. So by the time we get to the venue, we're pretty spicy. Wow. We're, like, we're here to play. <laughs> We've been driving around for 10 minutes within a mile from here for the last, you know, three hours. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's that's wild. But, well, well hey, we if don't you're. Know where we are, we're a bunch of 25 year old crazy people. But yeah, so, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so I grew up with all that, all that traveling that my parents like to do. And we like to, uh, and then just so many things in my life I did. So I ended up, um, all my day jobs had to do with shipping and receiving and accounting and doing inventory in warehouses full of one product or another. So I became kind of good at now I do my accounting. I can go to my tax guy and I can turn in all the inventory. I know how to do all that stuff. I know how to ship things properly. I know how to wrap packages properly. And yeah, you know, so I was kind of being trained for that business and trained for traveling and trained for staying awake a long time. And yeah, there was, there it, was, there was a lot of things I did that led up to all the things you need to be able to do to be in a band. Yeah. And I was being trained to play music from an early age. So now everything playing, yeah. I can't get somebody to come play something. I just go, and I just sit down and do it myself. Then <laughs> I have had bands come in and do some recordings where somebody lived a pretty far way away and it was a very minor change. So what I'll do in that case is um, like, I'll just go over and they just need the snares, just a little funky in a spot or whatever. And I can't really edit it. So I'll just pull up the snare. <laughs> go, okay, here it is. <laughs> Yeah, it works. Bat, 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 bat. There it is. <laughs> I don't even. That's awesome. It. Just... it all led to the bigger picture, you know. And I think yeah. Black Duma is is that bigger picture. Now, now it's Indeed. crazy, like talking about the road and everything. And I do, I have to ask, like, what what are your favorite memories being in Hollow's Eve, like on the road, doing all these gigs? Like, do you have any favorite stories or memories? Well, I. I... I think for me, it was the the main thing is that I knew that once we were, had that first album out and we decided to go touring and I was living the exact lifestyle I had always had the goal and dream of living from 85 to 88 till the lead singer quit. 
at the end mm -hmm. of 88. But that section right there was really one of the best times of my life, even with all the crazy stuff or the hard stories or, I mean, we slept in campgrounds. That was our trick. <laughs> Everybody's like, we, we'd stay at people's houses some, but we actually preferred not to. So we would, we would often stay at campgrounds. So we had this RV with a trailer and it's a bunch of long haired dudes. There's a bunch of families in there too. And, you know, and we're like, trying oh, to be camping trip. Yeah. Problems. <laughs> That's but, awesome. Uh, but anyway, we had so much, those are one of my memories that, that all the campground fun waking up on a picnic table outside of Salt Lake city. And, and I'm laying there and I have a, I have a, a sheet over me and a pillow with a pillowcase that says safari in on it from la <laughs> which is it's so typical band thing to be doing i've yeah. got a stolen pillow this says safari in and anybody from la knows where that is it's on west olive and it's kind of a famous it's been in a, the front of it's been in some movies and stuff but anyway, uh -huh. that's where the pillow came from and i'm laying there and when i woke up i was like <laughs> i looked up and it was like star wars snow was coming down at me and i went Oh my fucking oh my god. Wow. It's snow. So I wake up and there's this smooth <laughs> layer of snow. All day. I'm laying on the beach table and I'm going, we really do rough it, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> or one That's time so in Arizona, funny. we were in a rest, wow. we were in a rest area and we all went and grabbed a like got off the ground because there's snakes and junk. So we all got off the ground. Everybody's in, up in a couple of people stayed in the, the van and um the rest of us all got out on picnic tables. That's that's a that's a hack and then these rangers suddenly wake us all up and said hey you guys probably ought to not be sleeping we're not you're not in trouble or anything but we just uh sighted a mountain lion about 200 yards from me he's probably stalking you oh my god we're like really i mean we don't know anything about mountain lions and arizonas and deserts and everything we're from georgia we're just like oh really whoa, whoa. so we got up and we went okay thanks a lot we're you know and we we got out of there before they found some reason to be giving us trouble but we were always like tarred and feathered out of town. We were like, yeah, I think we better leave now. <laughs> that, yeah, that would have been a crazy way for Hollow's Eve to end. Yeah, for us. <laughs> yeah, death from now we life. have a story. Very metal. Now, but yeah, now you... we always we had a lot of those kind of little adventures, and I always say the best story is I cannot tell. Yes, yeah. They'll either go to the grave or eight people got to die before I put out the book. Oh God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're really, no, the archives. I'll never tell. I'll never tell. But they were really good stories. Now, a really cool story about Hollow's Eve is—is—is uh, is, is this true? Did you guys play your first show the fir the same day the first album came out? Yes. We hardly thought much of it until later, and I started thinking back on it and going, "Who does that? Who who gets signed, makes an album, and the very day, July the twelfth, nineteen eighty five, the first time our album is on the shelf." And the first time we see it, which shows you how it works back then, at uh, at Black Doom, I include the artist, on, and I let them do the proofs with me for the album design, the the vinyl design, all that. And Metal Blade, you just turn your stuff in, and you'll see your <laughs> album on the shelf is the next time you see it. Well, that's how it worked then, anyway. Wow. So uh, we didn't care that way. We just thought that's how it worked anyway. But we we didn't care. We turned it in, and we're ready to go. Yeah, um, so wow. yeah, July the twelfth, nineteen eighty five. We were playing our first show, and a a guy from a store brings us the album and shows it to us for the first time, right before we walk on stage, like fifteen minutes before. And that of course, is... we got all pumped up. We played the show, they go, you know, we've made it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hell of a day for you then. But who that... does that? There are very debut record. We never played at all. The only reason people had heard of us and we could get signed is we were constantly. We stayed, I stayed on the phone and constantly hounded college radio stations to play our demo tape. And I constantly put us, got us in magazines and fanzines and whatever. And so people had heard of us and all this, but we hadn't actually done anything. All we did was rehearse. We, we wanted to do stuff, but I said, I, my, my theory at the time and sort of still is, is that what are you out playing and promoting? If you're, if you don't have an album out, what are you selling? What are you promoting? Yeah. Hey, we're promoting our practices went well. I mean, why are you going through all the trouble to tour everywhere if you don't have anything? So I said, yeah. I want to wait until the album comes out before we tour. And to this day, that's what I do. I make, I work in seasons. I am now recording. 
when we have not a, not just the single, but when I have the next EP or album out, then we'll go do shows supporting that. Yeah. Combined with some old stuff and ending with a Hallow's Eve song. And then, you know, that's what I did the last time it came out. There was a pre-sale campaign of three months. I did audio single, video single every two weeks. Audio, video, audio, video, audio, video, leading right up to the actual release date. Uh, all that was during pre pre-sale was open. But uh, and then we went, uh, the album came out and we went and did shows for 14 months. Stop, time to record now. So there's going to be like a year because I have, I got to produce somebody's album and so forth. So there's going to be about a year where we, we would take shows. We did take two recently, both were festivals and sort of a guaranteed audience, and they were within a two hour drive of our house. Yeah. We did wow. that. So we said yes to that. We don't actually have to move because my drummer has a duplicate. The drum set in the studio is a duplicate of his drum set. That's my drum set. Oh, okay. But it is a duplicate of his. Yeah. So we don't, it stays mic'd up for we're in the middle of rehearsing. We get inspired. We can just turn it on and record it. It stays yeah. mic'd up. It stays touched up. I wasn't kidding about the kick drum out. The resonator. <laughs> the last, he's got to come back and re-record. Not, I could have done something about that, but. Anyway, he's got to re-record this Saturday, the thing that we recorded last Saturday, but there was two or three little technical difficulties like that. But yeah, that's exactly what we, um, that's what we yeah. did. Yeah, and how play. big of a, how big of an audience was it? Like huh? a little small, how how big of a show was it? Like how many people? It wasn't a huge festival. It was a festival in that there were lots of people there. One was, okay. one was, um, had, um, it was about 300 people. It did sell out for that venue in Atlanta. And cool. uh, it also had a, a Tentress was one of the bands. Summoner's Circle. Okay. We also played with at uh, Tennessee Metal Devastation Festival. <laughs> there was some good bands there. So that's why we wanted to be on the bills because we, we said, oh, there's like two or three club style headliners that are at this thing. It's going to draw and nobody had seen us for that so we went okay there's our show we only play like twice a year in our hometown and i said yeah. okay that's one of them the other yeah. one is called ogre fest it's a two-day festival that's a diabetes charity that we play at every year <clears throat> and we don't have to move equipment they we just show up with bass symbols and um so what they do is the bands that play uh the place is pretty packed up the bands that play uh, all the all the stuff that's there um, goes to an intended one person who's having trouble playing their bills, who has diabetes, and they just they can't afford their medicine or whatever. And so we do this festival. There's an auction, so people bring things. I like to paint. I do a thing where I paint on records. Oh, cool! And I usually so for so for Doomsday Deferred, you get the what you get is in a frame. You get the record. You get the the actual Doomsday Deferred untouched with a painted record with a scene from it. I did the back of the album cover on the, on the record. It comes in there and I sign it and date it and framed it. And that's what I added. And it's auctioned and it's sold for 50 bucks. Wow. That, that stuff's all donated to the uh, intended person also. That's really cool. Uh, really cool to hear. You're also, so just, uh... we don't know who the person is, but we know the, you know, the, the promoter tells us the story of how, that person's doing but they don't necessarily tell us who it is but they at the end of the thing they just literally go over and hand them a bunch of money and go go get some medicine i would i wish more artists uh were involved with stuff like that because yeah, that's really I like cool being involved in stuff like that it's the yeah. same as like helping bands because i'm older and been around for a while and i want to help people it's the same thing i want to i like using my music it's a gift you have to do something it's then you're giving that gift because of that gift you're helping someone else. Yeah. So you're giving them a gift also from your gift. And I, I just like the whole sound of it. It just, it's just good. I have diabetes, so I'm particularly interested in helping someone who has diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, well, Tommy, this has been a great conversation and, uh, I'm sorry it's so long. No, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy. Uh, the longer, the better, honestly. I'm with, a, uh, I'm a yacker. I'm, I'm just very energetic and passionate about what goes on. And well, well I loved. Well, don't, don't apologize. I, I like. If anything, I, I would totally do this longer. It's just. Uh, oh yeah. Unfortunately, 
I'll talk the other day. Schedule, turn it you off know? and come over and I'll tell you the bad stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turn it off. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, I will definitely uh, meet up in person at some point. Um, but oh, sure. this is, this is we cool. All, so we all kind of end up meeting one day. Yeah. We really Eventually. Do. I, I, I end up, people say, Oh, do you know so and so? And I go, oh, Well, I'm acquainted. I don't have any kind of, we don't really know each other, but I go, I'm acquainted with so and so. And they go, yeah, we've met twice, and so and we've kept up now and then, and said a thing or two in conversation online. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. I go, we kind of all. You're like a, you know, it's like the six degrees of separation. Uh -huh. I think in music, especially in heavy metal, we're all like one degree separation. Definitely. If you don't Definitely. know somebody, you're already aware of them anyway, more than likely. Yeah, yeah. It is such a just a tight community, and it, it always kind of has been. Um, so. Is there anything, so I, I know you have a little deal going on with uh, Black Duma right now with like some signed records um, and you also what? maybe have some. <laughs> I have lots of deals going on. Yeah. Is, is, do you not have any? Oh, that. Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The DM me thing. As a matter of fact, let's see. Do not try to have Hallow's Eve albums around. I, I have to, if anybody ever says anything about a price, I'm saying I go, dude, I have to go buy them to have them for you but when i go to shows i try to have some cds and albums sometimes they're used i've gotten them off ebay myself yeah but um i did offer on uh instagram to um i ran across some copies that were new they hit well they ne they haven't been touched and uh i said yeah i'll come on and sign it if you want to dm me and uh you know make them settle on an offer and usually i get about 40 or 50 dollars for an album like that and cool. sometimes i have to pay 20 to 25 30 to get it yeah so i just up it a little bit and i and i'll and i'll get the shipping people offer to pay the shipping too and i go no 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 no. i, I work at a company and uh <laughs> and in case you don't know for your band's sake this is a tip for bands if you run your band as a business your shipping is deductible on your taxes oh okay so i don't really mind paying the shipping yeah well, well, good to know. You want tips for running your band? Your tour mileage is deductible. Hotels are deductible. Everybody says, what's a hotel? And I go, I don't know why you're not staying in one. It's deductible. <laughs> yeah. You get it back. It is a business. Like, this whole thing is a business. I you run know? mine as a business. And, yeah. Uh, you kinda, you have mileage, to. Tolls, some food. Um, lots of stuff. The art that I pay for to be on my album covers is deductible. Really? I didn't know that. A lot of people don't know that. Yes, I have a great tax attorney. He's learned <laughs> a lot from me. He teaches me something every year that I didn't know before. And I I, I didn't even know this till he showed me and I went, what? I've been going to this guy for 10 years. He shows me on there on Schedule C that where it says professional services and whatever. The f paying for the tax attorney, everybody says, oh, well, that, that would cost too much. And I go, he's deductible too. They go, what? wow, go, sure is. Wow. Your, the, your tax preparer is a deduction if you have a business. Yeah. Wow. That's insane. That's crazy. It's, <laughs> I don't think a lot of I wish more bands did from this stuff because I know I wasn't about 10 years ago. I started, and then when I started running the label, I really had to learn about everything. And I have to make sure to have my inventory right, cost of goods, and the CPUs. I got to have it all in place. Yes. So uh, I learned a whole lot. But yeah. This guy taught me a lot about deductions. You don't want to have a million of them, but I'm, I'm looking <laughs> down here because I have files of them. Mileage, postage, professional services. My storage space is deductible that I keep all the boxes of albums in. Shelves wow. In. That's deductible. Wow. That's insane. That, well, that's, I, I wish more bands knew that because they probably don't know a quarter of the things you wow. just told me. But if they went to a, um, Instead of going to a, doing it themselves or going to Jackson Hewitt or whatever, if they went and got a professional tax preparer, that's probably a little more pricey. It'll cost more, but they'll also they'll start learning about those things because they're going to show you and you're going to go, what? And you're, yep. They're, they're going to say, mine says, did you buy any equipment last year? And I go, I bought a base. And they go, where's the receipt? Deductible. Wow. Um, I deduct strings. But I don't mm. buy very many because I don't change my strings. Very much. <laughs> hey, uh, everybody's like, how can you change your strings? And I go, I, I really don't. 
I think I happen to like them kind of deadened. When, when, how often do you change your spr- strings? Like once every. Man, I buy like, I'm buying a set of strings right now because someone's working on one of my bases and he's putting a, a flat wound set on there. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'm buying that, but. I bought um like I bought a set of I bought seven sets of strings in 2013. I still actually have some of those. Wow. But I've bought and... a couple of other sets. Once a year I've bought once or two because I want to try a different thing or a different sound or whatever for some recording or something. So it comes into play, but I think I probably bought 12 sets of strings in 10 years. Wow. I generally don't wow. change them. I don't like, I really hate the sound of new strings on my bass um, for me because there's this little tinny up on the higher string. There's this little tinny squeaking thing. And I just hate that. <laughs> it's unintended noise coming from your instrument. Eat, man, eat, man. I'm going to stop. Mm. So I have this cool bass that's a five string. I play five strings. This is a double neck and it's a five string on one side. It's a four string fretless on the other side. That's cool. It was That's a gift awesome. To my wife, a couple of about two years ago, but I never had it really worked on and customized to be sounding like me. It sounded real good anyway. But so anyway, I've took it in and having them change up some wiring on it, a couple of switches. They're making the switch where it's either one side or the other side. In the middle won't be a blend, so I won't make a mistake in while I'm using it because I don't really use the blend. And okay. little things like that. I'm having to put flat wound on the, uh, so it'll be very slippery, slidey sounding. It awesome. already would have been, but if you have ground, if you, if you have round wound on the, uh, and you're doing it on wood neck, it'll grind into it and mess it up. So I'm getting flat wound put on it, which I've never had before. I'm looking over there because I actually did buy a pack I didn't use because it was not, I, it wasn't the kind I should have gotten. Anyway, I'm looking at yeah. up in storage. So I have a, another pack in storage right now. I don't know. It'll come out sometime. Huh? Anyway, anyway, yeah, I'll talk shop with you all day. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that's cool to know. And, and, and like, don't be sorry that this has gone on. When it, when I it, prefer, I prefer these kind of interviews where it's like a kind of like a pod. Well, it is a podcast, but, you know, where it's a little more casual. It's not like yes, no questions. It's, oh, no. And I, I could have brought nice. in props. I've got. Here's my actual diral skull. That's awesome. Resin, I guess, but made from the models of the ones at La Brea Tar Pits. Wow. Uh, I was in Baltimore, and the place I was at, <laughs> I found a, my, a mouse skeleton. Wow. Are you big into, like, bones and skulls? I think it will start. Yeah, I think, I think it look starts. Look what I found. With... This is, like, That's completely cool, man. clean and... I was like, I can do something with it. I don't know why, but I don't know. Encase it in some little display thing, I guess. Learn how to clean it first. You, you yeah, you that. see the guy who made a um, he made like a guitar out of someone's like rib cage. There's this guy. Oh this guy, his brother died, and in his will, he wanted his bones to be turned into a guitar. So I, I think you, you would it. have to have a permit. There's some type of permit you'd have to have to actually possess human remains i believe i think you can get it and it's not that big of a deal but i think you yeah he must have done that it is because when you cremate somebody like say your spouse passes away and you cremate it you have to have paperwork with you to transport it i don't know if you know that so I that don't. happened to me and yeah you have to have the paperwork on you because cremated remains basically looks like a big sack of cocaine <laughs> But wow. uh, so that's why so I was, that's it, what they told me. They said, so you need to have this out sitting in the seat, ready to show somebody in case you like, went, this is oh, a man, dead person. Of that. They said, well, yeah, you're not, nobody's supposed to possess human remains without having a, a sheet saying this is human remains. Yeah, don't worry. It's not a dead person. It's a, or no, sorry. It's not cocaine. It's a dead body. <laughs> that, that, right. That's a weird yeah the weird either or that's, it's exactly that's so the kind of thing i'd probably i don't know nothing against anybody but a lot of times when i get pulled over they're trying to make something out of something when there's nothing going on yeah i've had that a lot yeah i've been there too. just kind of looking like this too there. did you have a beer tonight it's five in the morning 
I'm on my way home. Yeah. Yeah. I go, it's almost the next day. The, the sun's about to come up. And like, Did you have a beer tonight? And I go, well, tonight is hasn't happened yet, but, <laughs> but you, I, I'm going to assume you meant like in the past night. Yeah. Leaving. And they go, well, don't try to make this difficult. Just tell the truth. And I said, yes, at seven o'clock at the club I was at, somebody handed me, I generally don't drink on stage or when I'm out doing stuff like I'm working. To me, I'm at work. And I said, yes, somebody handed me a beer and said, hey, bro, I want to get a beer. They gave me a beer. They walked off. And uh, I did take a swallow because they were standing there. And then I walked around the corner and sat it down and never came back to it. I was just trying to be polite. Yeah. I said, and that happened at about seven o'clock. He said, that's all I'm asking, man, is to tell the truth. I went, well, it's really not that big of a deal to tell. I mean, yeah, 10 hours ago, I drank one swallow of a beer. Yeah. I, I'll be glad to say that in any court, and I'm sure it'll be, they'll say, get this guy out of here. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous, it, especially a lot of cops now with everything going on are a little uh, more uptight, unfortunately. Yeah. And, like, well, I've had to deal with it, too. too. I mean, I don't want to, I have a nephew who is a, is a cop. And uh, so, I mean, I get it, but, but, um, uh, there's a lot of real things going on. Please don't try to make something out of what's nothing's going on. It's just nothing's happening. Yeah. Now, now we were talking about beer and, and you're doing a lot of doom metal now. Are, what's, what's your relationship with pot? You've never tried it now that you're Dude, doing pot? doom metal weed THC. Oh, yes. pot. Um, uh, when I'm in high, when I was in high school, I think people to this day remember me as that guy who was always stoned. Oh, really? <laughs> That's awesome. But I kind of stopped, except for um, maybe 10 times. I kind of stopped, like, in my first year of college. I just stopped. It was just, I couldn't do college with it. Mm -hmm. Showing up at 7 in the morning, listening to Pink Floyd all the way to school. Uma Guma. I up at 7 in the morning to do, like, <laughs> you know, high-end math. And I'm I'm sitting there in my head. I'm here at Interstellar Overdrive, and I'm. <laughs> And you know, in that set in the, the walls doing that 70s show thing where it's going up and down behind the math teacher, and yeah, yeah, and I'm sitting going, the, the quadratic occasion. What, <laughs> yeah, well, I have no idea what's happening in class. And I said, oh, I can't, I can't do this, I can't. So I had to kind of grow up a little bit about um, when and where to do things, appropriate places and times, yeah, but I stopped and I didn't really do it for a long time. Now that I'm older, it's so funny you brought that up. Recently, and especially since the, it's more legalized, um, so I had about, I had about, I had three operations last year about something, and uh, there was a lot of pain involved in recoveries. There was the recoveries between operations it was like nine weeks, so I decided to try gummies to help me since there was only so much medicine they would give me. Yeah, and honestly. It, it did help. It didn't solve the problem, but it did help pain, I think. It was an abdominal pain. Mm. If it didn't, I thought it did, at least. It yeah. seemed like I felt better. And I was in a better mood, and I, I think it did help. Cool. So, um, well, that pairs so well started, with what you're doing. So, yeah, you know, and eventually, uh, so now, yeah, sure, on Saturday night, I'll take a toke. And <laughs> if I'm going to be home and I'm watching Sfinguli, and we're done with anything important. I don't, I don't do, I don't talk to people once I've done that. I, I don't do business. I don't pay bills. I don't make decisions. I, that's yeah. just when we're done, done, done. If you ask me some important question, I'm not going to, I go, I'm not talking about that right now. Yeah. So, but yeah. So it's funny because now I've gotten in my sixties. I'm kind of going back to it. Going, I don't know. Why it's not? come full circle. Know. And especially yeah. in, in Direwolf too, it's like uh, 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 now uh, I'll understand my own music. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very fitting, especially doing doom metal. Well, I know but, it's funny. Yeah, one one of my friends said I tried to listen to your album, but I couldn't. In five minutes, I went to sleep, and I said, "She had somebody who didn't really listen to doom metal." I said, "Did you smoke any pot before you?" <laughs> Did I smoke? I said, "Did you smoke before you listen?" She goes. No, and I said, "Well, that's the whole problem." Yeah, that's, be a lot that's the missing link, right there. Stoned and then listen to Direwolf. Yeah, it all <laughs> makes sense. You'll go, "Oh, that's what he's talking about." Yeah, 
Yeah, that's it, so it, funny. it doesn't have any. You don't have to smoke pot to listen to my music, but <laughs> kind of messy. It does it. help. Yeah, it does, it does seem like it goes together. Yeah, yeah it, it's great. And, you regardless. know, if you look at my last album cover, I don't know if you've seen it. It's, it's I, the leaves. Of, a lot of leaves, a yeah. lot of nature imagery. Everything's green. The pullout's green. Everything, the vinyl's green and whatever. We're changing. We're so that was the brand of that album. That was the whole idea of it. So it was it was kind of implied pottery going on. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So uh we're changing I, for the the next stuff will be more energetic and it'll be a completely different color scheme and all that stuff. Hell yeah, man. So I already have the Dyer's Wolf for a single. I'm dying to put it out. I'm dying. What, to is, is that announced I wish yet? I could get you to hear it right now. Yeah, is the single announced yet? No, it'll still be a while. I actually can't. okay. I had it's I'm still picking at the mid. I I put it on every day and go, now did I really like that yesterday? And I go, <laughs> eh, it's not in a hurry. So I just sort of start the day with it. And I go, while I'm brushing my teeth or whatever, I put it on and go. I could bring that one little vocal backup vocal up right there. And then I do that one touch and I go, okay, save. We'll hear it again tomorrow. Yeah. And I was just sort of at that point with it. Cause I'm having fun with it. It's pretty much ready to go. So I have to master it. And I just now got the, I just now got the artwork completed on it. Awesome. Very exciting. Uh, so, so we got uh black Duma records. We got dire wolf, you know, we got hollows Eve. Tommy Stewart, it's been an honor. What's the best way for fans and everyone to just keep in touch with you and your label? Oh, I'm like on social all, media. I'm, a, I'm on socials everywhere. It's probably going to say Black Duma Records. Some of it says Tommy Stewart, but I pretty much do everything under Black Duma Records. They're, we're on Facebook, Bandcamp. Uh, there's a dot com, which I need to catch up with the new bands and <laughs> uh, always have work to do. There's dot com, Bandcamp, YouTube channel, which is one of my favorite places. I love it when you can see the band's idea of the song as well as hear it. Yes. So I'm, de I'm definitely into watching bands' videos and sharing them. And they don't have to be on the label. I just sometimes, especially on Sunday mornings, I'll go, I'll find somebody I really like that's not on the label. I don't, and I just, I put them out there because I just want people to see it and hear it. And I go, Man, y'all got to check these guys out. I love going on the groups too. So I'm a, I I prowl the groups, all the Doom groups. I'm on all of them. Awesome. That's a awesome. good place for you to find that certain. I'm on all the Doom groups, so but you can go on there every day, and there's something good on each one of them. There's I'm probably on like thirty or forty. I, I've learned a lot from them, honestly. Um, and I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot here too, man. So uh, yeah, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank I you so much, it. Brandon the Brave. Yes. Everybody, <laughs> I'm Brennan Baddock, and this is Disturbing the Priest. <laughs>